good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. I'm Sandra Angel, International Courses of Project Manager at the Merio Foundation. And I would, I would like to warmly welcome you to this ACDX webinar on the evolution of diagnostic testing to get out of the COVID-19 pandemic, which is co-organized by the Merio Foundation and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. In lieu of the 11th edition of the advanced course on diagnostic now postponed to January 2022, this online event is organized to bring together experts from different continents to explain and discuss how decentralizing, decentralizing sorry, access to diagnostic from healthcare to community testing, but also adapting regulatory requirement to the need of the field and developing strategy for detecting and monitoring variants are really critical factors of success to get out of the pandemic. The event is on social media, so you can tweet using the hashtag ACDX webinar. And today we are very pleased to welcome uh, Professor Rosanna Pilling and Dr. Alexandre Costa as moderators of this event. And I'm now giving the floor to, do to Dr. Alex Costa, who will open the webinar. Thank you and enjoy the conference. Good morning, <laughs> good afternoon, and good evening, everybody, depending on where you are. Now, my name is Alex Costa, and um, I work at UNICEF headquarters in New York as a diagnostics advisor. I have been a proud member of the ACDX community since 2013, and I remember we've talked about the role of diagnostics in pandemic preparedness and response several times. One lesson that we have learned from previous epidemics and pandemics, and now through the COVID-19 pandemic, is how important diagnostics are in pandemic preparedness and response. Diagnostics are like the ears and the eyes on the pandemic. It is through diagnostics that we know who's infected, how the virus is mutating, and where it's spreading, and even whether a vaccine is effective. COVID-19 diagnostics specifically plays a role, an essential role, role in this pandemic on patient diagnosis and management, to detect outbreaks and support contact tracing, to assess vaccine efficacy and identify new virus variants, and to ensure safety in schools, workplaces, public events, and during travel. To paraphrase Alain Merriot, without diagnostics, we're blind. Actually, we're blind and we're deaf. We're operating in the dark without information to guide our interventions because diagnostics allows us to see what's happening in the pandemic. Otherwise, it's just a best guess. And while the COVID-19 pandemic has again placed a spotlight on the importance of diagnostics, it has also exposed how we have not learned the lessons from the past. And many challenges remain to strengthen diagnostic systems. One of the main challenges for scale up of COVID diagnostics today is the limited diagnostic capacity and workforce in many low and middle income countries. This was a problem in previous pandemics and remains a problem today. Another challenge to strengthen diagnostic systems is its complexity because it's made of many moving parts. So we cannot cover all the different elements of diagnostic systems today, but we are going to focus on three elements of this system that are playing a critical role um, for development and adoption of diagnostics in this pandemic. As you can see here on the screen in the, in the program, in part one, we're going to discuss how the performance of new tasks can be evaluated. And we will look into strategies that can be used to deploy COVID-19 tests in different settings. In part two, a roundtable discussion will focus on adapting regulatory requirements to facilitate access to diagnostics and in part three, we'll talk about strengthening genomic sequencing capacity and surveillance strategies for detecting a virus variant. During the presentation and panel discussions, we encourage you, the participants, to ask questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of the page, the Q&A feature at the bottom of the page. You will also notice that you can vote on the questions from other participants. The questions with more votes will be prioritized and will be answered first because they represent that there's a general, and because the, your votes represent there's a general interest um, in those questions. 
So without further ado, I would like to start by introducing our first speaker, Dr. Daniel Bausch, who serves as the Director of Emerging Threats and Global Health Security at the Foundation for Innovation, Innovative Diagnostics, or FIND, where he leads the efforts on pandemic preparedness and response. He will talk about the COVID-19 uh, diagnostics pipeline and performance evaluation of COVID-19 diagnostic tests. Dr. Bausch, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks very much, Alex. Um, nice to, to be with all of you today. So I'm going to very briefly in 15 minutes just try to give you a, some of the highlights of where we are with diagnostics, the pipeline and performance evaluation, and um, and kind of set the scene for the, the rest of the discussion today. Okay. So, so um, first of all, almost everything that I'm going to present to you today, well, I'm happy to share the slides, but it's also all available on the FIND website. And so I encourage you to, to go look there. But, and th this is an example of what you'll find on the website, which is a, a COVID-19 test directory. And you can see you know, this really represents the incredible progress that has been made during this pandemic in diagnostic assays and the development of them. It's probably too small to, to see here, but if you look in the, um, I don't know if you can see my um, my cursor, but the assay targets, um, there are quite a few antigen assays that have come out and, and then antibody assays. Manufacturer by region is on there. You can see most of the manufacturers from Asia, then from Europe um, and going down different test formats. And so all this information is available on the website. Um, we we try to, to keep up with all the diagnostic tests that come out. And so on this test directory, there's right now 686 tests that are listed. There's on a, a former pipeline uh, website that is still there. You can see we have all 11, uh, 1,127 um, tests that are listed. And so this is the place to go really to find out kind of where we are. We're, we're trying to put all of these into a similar format on the, this test directory. So we encourage you to look for that and try to, to get more granular detail. Uh, I'll focus primarily on COVID-19 antigen and molecular diagnostic tools. And you can see there are quite a few that have come out in the, uh, the last few years. So um, antigen RDTs, 319 that have regulatory approval uh, from one or the other regulatory agencies. It depends upon where you look in the world. Uh, still quite a few um, in validation and still quite a few in development. So um, our antigen RDTs are the, the kind of the biggest player here. Then there are some point of care or near point of care antigen, um, non-lateral flow assays, and then uh, some molecular assays. So quite a bit of activity in this space that we're looking at. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all of these tests are equal in, in terms of their quality. And so if you look at the test, that have undergone more formal evaluation, and this is not complete evaluation, but have either emergency use authorization from the FDA or emergency use um, licensure from the WHO, the number is much, much smaller here. So um, if you can see in the FDA, so we have, I think it's five antigen RDTs that uh, are um, EUA categorized. In uh, at WHO, there's only three that have received EUL approval. This does not necessarily mean that there aren't other good tests out there. There are many that are still in the pipeline and there's considerable backlog. This is a, a lot of work to, to go through this process and try to figure out really what is um, a good assay and what's not a good assay. So you can see here in the, in the lower half of the slide under WHO, many antigen RDTs that are still under assessment as well as some other point of care molecular assays. So a lot of work to do to really evaluate these, these tests still um, and that's where one um, find comes in to try to help with that. So the the uh, the previous slide in terms of EUA or EUL um, approval comes basically from data that are internally generated from the makers of the test. And so what we try to provide is an avenue for find independent evaluations uh, of what data can be uh, can be supplied to try to really corroborate whether you know we're ha we have the best product and then how these would be used. And so if you look here, this is the process. We conduct um, performance evaluations on diagnostic tests um, to support accurate, affordable, accessible testing in LMICs. We're focused in, on LMICs. And uh, I want to stress that it's not only the science part of this. We're also extremely interested, of course, on the accessibility and the access uh, 
aspect. Uh, it's not enough to just have a good test. If you don't have a good test that's affordable in LMICs, of course, it's not used and of no real service. So we opened uh, back in March 2020 um, several expressions of interest for test suppliers and uh, presently have evaluated, you can see here, results available on the website, 22 manual PCR tests, 35 antibodies, 16 ELISAs, 20 antigen RDTs, and, and you have the link there for the, uh, the website to try to get more granular detail on that. The, the process is a study design. It's a prospective diagnostic evaluation. And I'm talking, talking specifically here about the um, antigen RDTs across multiple independent sites to, de uh, to determine the accuracy of these tests. Um, when I say independent sites, we try to, of course, have sites in different contexts. And so they're not all in high income countries, nor all in low and middle income countries. And so that we can compare results across uh, different settings. Uh, the the uh, the people doing the, the evaluation have to follow the inserts on the use, so we make sure that they try to basically specifically um, replicate how this test would be used, and not taking any more in-house approaches to try to enhance specificity or sensitivity. Usually, at one global north and one global south studied site, with the overall target of 100 PCR positives and 400 PCR negatives. So the call for partners and partners, meaning the, the uh, people who had assays that they wanted to evaluate, is now closed. Um, but the, the last selection was in in July 2021. And we don't um, take just all players because there are too many who would come into this. So we do some review and some triage in the beginning. And the triage you can see there um, is we're looking for supplier reported clinical and analytical performance. And so there has to be data um, from the supplier in the first instance that these tests look um, relatively favorable. The ease of use of the test, again, coming back into the access uh, aspect of this, that they need to be something that's practical in the field. The manufacturing distributing capacity. So we're looking um, from fines specifically for access in low and middle income countries. And so we need to make sure that even if the test is the, the best in terms of its performance evaluation, it can actually get distributed to those in need. And then um, we look at the regulatory status from WHO, EUL. This is not to say that all the makers have to have WHO, EUL, but we, we wouldn't, for example, take a test that's already been re rejected um, from WHO, EUL. And this is to, just to give you an idea of the study sites. Um, all the ones in kind of the dark purple are the antigen rapid test study sites. sites and you can see that they expand or uh, extend from high income countries to low income countries. The, uh, the ones that have an X by the name are the ones that are no longer um, involved in uh, doing these evaluations. And then um, on the other, the other um, colors on the graph are ones that are involved in antibody or other um, evaluations. We also look recognizing that uh, the analytical performance is um, important to, to get an idea of the sensitivity. So all the limits of detection are verified with a partner at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine using viral dilutions um, of an early strain. And then we're ongoing studies with the University Hospital of Geneva to try to look at the impact of uh, of strain or variance on the sensitivity of these tests. And so with the University Hospital of Geneva, we're testing them against various the, the, the variants that they have there to see if the uh, that impacts the sensitivity and specificity of the given RDT. We've chosen for that study some of the most promising RDTs in terms of the previous data and see how they hold up against um, different variants. That work is ongoing, so I won't be reporting anything there. And then, uh, again, the, the sequence data gathered at uh, the partner sites is, is important for us to, to know, and we're, we're looking at this. I, I won't get in um, to really the, the importance of sequencing, in part because, of course, that's going to come up in other talks who are going to go over the variants, but also um, because th th that's really not so much an R&D challenge. I think we have um, some fairly good tools for, for sequencing, but more um, a logistical challenge of getting it into place. And there are various different mechanisms through um, 
through the pandemic radar that has just initially been launched by uh, UK and WHO and also um, the ACTA work that um, Alex and I and others are, are working on to try to expand some of the uh, capacity for sequencing around the world. So that's an, an incredibly important part of this all to obviously to see what variants are circulating, but it's not particularly relevant on the R&D side, more on the logistics, logistics side. It, it could be important, of course, um, if we do see that uh, the sequence variation and the variants do have an impact on the, the uh, sensitivity or specificity of the diagnostic assays or the RDTs, but we're, we don't have those data quite yet. This is just an example that I wanted to show what you'll find on the website. This is actually not the ant antigens, but the, the antibody assays. And so if, you, uh, if you're interested in a particular anti antibody assay and you want to see the performance evaluation, you can go there and you can see the overall sensitivity at, in this particular case at day seven, days eight to 14, 15 days out, and, and the, the sensitivity rather, and, and the specificity. So this is the sort of data that you will find on the website. Really, we, we think a, a valuable service for trying to evaluate the tools that are out there. So key messages and next steps. First of all, I want to point out that despite this process um, that I just described, um, find is not a, a position to formally validate tests. So we arrange to have the performance evaluation done with different partners around the world and provide those data as a service. We are not a, a body that, um, that validates or invalidates. And so the data are there for people to, to uh, read and to interpret as they see fit. There is um, variability in performance across the assays you know, from where the, the site is tested. And so we may not have necessarily the same sensitivity and specificity in a high income country as a low income country. And it's not always um, uh, a factor of low income versus high income. So there is variability here. And um, we, we try to explain that where we can. Sometimes it's possible, sometimes it's not. But we'll continue to, to publish independent data on the performance of these RDTs. We have a, a few more um, still that have been accepted into the process in the, the last months uh, that we were accepting them into the process in, in July 2021. We're not accepting any more right now, but we're still evaluating the ones that are in the pipeline and trying to figure out kind of where we go next. So the, the next step um, are, is indeed to complete those evaluations of the RDTs that are presently under evaluation in uh, the last quarter of 2021 and first quarter of 2022. We'll be publishing an expression of interest for suppliers at point of care molecular platforms to participate in, uh, in independent evaluation. So that's a next step to extend into the molecular platforms and then um, and evaluate those in 2022. We'll be performing evaluations of self-testing of antigens uh, in the end of 2021. That work is ongoing right now. And then trying to figure out you know, where we go next and what the real needs are of this. This is an enormous amount of work to try to keep this process up and keep up with all the tests that keep coming out um, and then have the right study designs and thinking, do we need to go into uh, multiplex testing? This is just one aspect of Fine's work in, in terms of, of promoting different uh, tests and, and trying to work through the the, uh, the possibilities. But um, should we be looking at multiplex testing that have more than COVID? Um, so there's recently, for example, a lot of interest in, in tests that would detect COVID as well as TB and then different sample types. And we, we do have some data on this. I didn't have time to present it, but looking, of course, what most of the data I presented to you so far are, or is oriented towards uh, nasopharyngeal swabs, but there's data also on saliva and, and different um, types of, of tests. So I will um, stop there if I can get the there we go. So I will stop there, Alex, and uh, I think we have time for questions at the end. I wanted to especially thank Camille Escafale, um, who uh, who really put together these slides and is kind of the key person um, at FIND who, who's done most of this work. So thanks very much. Thanks, Daniel. So I, I just want to emphasize how important it is to actually know how to evaluate the performance of tests at this stage and know where to find reliable information. And the reason why, as the numbers speak for themselves, is that there's a, a large number of low performance tests that have entered 
the markets, especially in unregulated markets in low income countries. And sometimes the use of these tests put into question the reliability and credibility of diagnostic tests and creates the test hesitancy. So I, uh, I thank you very much for this presentation and I would like to point the participants to a reliable source of information, which is the FINE website. Um, so in this uh, next presentation, we're gonna have Professor, Professor Razan Apilin, who is the director of the International Diagnostic Center at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, among many other things, I must say. Uh, we'll speak about, uh, she will speak about the testing strategies for deployment of COVID-19 tests in different settings. Rosanna, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I like to, um, I like to say that the pandemic has really given us many teachable moments, but one of the most important that uh, we need to be aware of is that diagnostic testing is you know, really, really critical. And there are many ways that diagnostics can be used. So um, at the very beginning of the pandemic in, in March uh, of 2020, um, the Director General of WHO already urged countries to test, test, and test. He said that testing, isolation, and contact tracing should be the backbone of our global pandemic response. Now, usually for uh, diseases of epidemic potential, diagnostics are important at a patient level for confirming the clinical diagnosis in symptomatic patients, which enables the patients to get the right treatment and the right management. And also, if there are uh, ways that the patient can uh, adopt to stop the in, uh, spread of infection, such as uh, self-isolation, wearing a mask, et cetera, then those could be implemented. Now, at a population level, um, diagnostics are important for disease control and prevention because with the case detection, then it allows a contact tracing. Sorry, um, should go back. Sorry, um, allows the contact tracing and screening of those who are at enhanced risk of acquiring and transmitting an infection. This is all to try and interrupt the chain of transmission within the community. And with this cases, you've seen daily that we could actually see dashboards of where the cases are occurring so that we could track the pattern of spread and the speed of the uh, spread and identify any hotspots uh, that require special interventions. We could also uh, then use that uh, data to guide the implementation of control strategies, such as you know, mass mandates, quarantines, and lockdowns uh, or border measures. Now, as, as Dan had uh, pointed out, there's like almost a thousand different brands of diagnostic tests that have been commercialized. Uh, a lot of molecular tests, in fact, most of them are manual tests, but also lots of uh, test kits. Uh, some are lab-based and some are uh, a point of care. They are the gold standard in terms of case detection uh, because they are highly sensitive and highly specific. The, the downside is that they, they are, because of the technical complexity, um, require uh, trained personnel. They're not very accessible unless the country has a, a good lab system. And, uh, and then they are quite costly compared to the other uh, types of tests. Now, um, there are point of care molecular tests that are more accessible, but they are still instrument dependent and therefore um, are still limited by the speed of the manufacturing, as well as the, uh, the cost being still quite a bit higher than antigen tests. Um, so antigen tests uh, allow um, us to detect viral proteins uh, and the rapid tests, as you saw from Dan's presentation, can give you an indication within 15 minutes whether somebody's 
um, uh, infected or not. So it's used to confirm infection is more accessible and is um, less costly than molecular tests. And then we have antibody tests that are host markers rather than a direct detection of the pathogen. And those come up later and they are used mostly as uh, exposure uh, for a marker of exposure and for surveillance. Now, in, in the early days of the pandemic, when there was a global competition for um, uh, reagents for PCR tests or molecular tests, many countries don't have a limitation, uh, don't have any supplies um, uh, of these uh, molecular tests. And so they are the only things that they have on hand are antibody tests. And so they have to resort to using those to confirm uh, infection which was not ideal. Now, throughout the pandemic, from the beginning, because it's a relatively new pathogen, even though we know that there are seasonal coronaviruses, we don't know this particular one. So once the sequence was known, um, in the first phase of the pandemic, the diagnostics uh, that we have were used to try and refine the uh, COVID-19 case definition to try and figure out all the symptoms that are typical uh, of this um, uh, infection. And, uh, and of course, they are used to test all symptomatic individuals uh, to confirm uh, their infection, enable public health measures, and for us to determine at a population uh, level the extent and the speed of infection and try to understand their modes of transmission. And the use of uh, uh, testing for uh, contacts and uh, uh, are, you know, really important to interrupt the chain of transmission. So that's within the first uh, part of um, the pandemic for the first few, three months. But then um, from case uh, uh, detection and contact tracing studies, we realize that uh, there are people who are either asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic, which means that they weren't symptomatic at the time of testing, but became symptomatic sometime later. Those people are actually as likely to transmit infection as um, people who are symptomatic. So then we need to really scale up testing of um, asymptomatic individuals, especially those who are at risk, uh, because mass testing is, is not possible um, on a global scale. And so targeted screening of asymptomatic in, individuals within communities become very important. And so um, there's uh, the, the ones that are at enhanced risk are like care home workers, uh, uh, care, uh, healthcare workers, care home workers, first responders, and, um, and also occupational groups such as uh, truck drivers uh, and meat packing plants, for example, uh, tend to have outbreaks. And so those um, are really people that we need to test. And then many countries who aren't able to do a lot of uh, uh, community testing or scale-up testing start to impose lockdowns to slow the spread of um, uh, COVID in order to save the healthcare system from being overwhelmed. And now in, the, in this current phase of the infection with vaccine rollout, then the um, row of testing changes. Uh, rapid tests are now used to save life and livelihoods by allowing the economic recovery and reopening of schools, workplaces, et cetera. And, uh, and because of the variance of concern being able to be transmitted a lot faster, um, then uh, uh, and at you know more likely to to transmit to more people. So some countries started to add arrivals testing and quarantine uh, for travel in order to reduce um, importation risk. But as we transition to a control of the virus per, uh, from a pandemic response and try to live with the virus, uh, it's likely that now testing for surveillance is going to be more important. Now, molecular testing, the, the cost, the requirement for equipment and trained personnel. Now, one thing that's really important is that uh, even with point of care molecular tests, being able to uh, uh, 
be available to to um, reduce the test time from one or two hours to maybe 15, 20 minutes or 30, uh, 35 to 45 minutes, um, we've seen that there's been um, a lack of supply uh, because of the speed of manufacturing. And in fact, um, I want to show you an example of how um, uh, in, in Africa, in Kenya, in May of 2020, when the government of Kenya decided that every truck driver, because they, if they're infected, they could be carrying the infection uh, throughout the country and to other countries. So they were um, uh, targeted as a, a, a population that should be screened. But the results of these tests were taking a PCR test. We're taking about uh, uh, two weeks to get uh, reserved. And so a lot of the goods were being um, stuck at the port of Mombasa in Kenya, uh, instead of being uh, taken to other countries. And so what is the solution? The International Organization for Migration decided to um, provide the, um, the truck drivers with a faster uh, COVID um, PCR tests and uh, to allow the results to be available within 24 to 36 hours. And, um, and they tested about 17,000 drivers from July to October uh, with a positivity rate of uh, 2%, which is actually not too um, much above the uh, community rate. And so that resolved the, the log jam uh, at, the, at the ports. So quit, you know, time to result is really critical in, in this respect. And so uh, Michael Mina and his group at Harvard has done some modeling to try to uh, look at um, the, the balance between uh, test sensitivity, frequency of testing and turnaround time. And what the model showed was that with the cheaper uh, antigen tests and the faster time to result, you could actually, uh, if you see on this graph, every round dot is a, a testing point, a screening point. Um, and the uh, antigen tests allow you to screen uh, more frequently versus uh, PCR tests, which is uh, lower on the on the graph. You could see that um, uh, you, if you have more infrequent testing, uh, you are less likely to hit the uh, period of the eight days uh, post onset of symptoms at which a person may be um, uh, spreading the infection. So with that, that's driven a lot of the innovation in terms of single use disposable antigen rapid tests. And here I'm showing you some examples of the ones that have uh, emergency authorization from the FDA um, th that are used for both asymptomatic and symptomatic uh, individuals uh, with a nasal swab or a nasopharyngeal swab, very high sensitivity and specificity. And some of them are actually licensed as home tests as well. And you could see also WHO, as Dan says, has only um, uh, approved uh, a three tests for emergency use authorization for antigen rapid tests. And I listed in bold the uh, CT values. So CT values are cycle thresholds and the higher the number, it means that the, uh, the lower the viral load. So we usually look at whether antigen tests can detect people with CT values of 25 or lower, which means that they are within that um, infectivity, uh, they are at risk of uh, transmission. And you could see that these antigen tests do very well uh, with, the, um, uh, with these um, uh, uh, detecting high viral loads. Now, one thing is that uh, with the variants of concern, because most of the antigen RDTs use nucleocapsid protein as a target, so they're unlikely to be affected by variants of concern where the mutations are in the spike protein uh, instead of the nucleocapsid protein. 
Now, um, the, I want to give you an example of the use of antigen tests on the national level. Uh, the government of Cameroon decided that uh, because of the um, lack of infrastructure for PCR testing and the long time to result, they would rather use rapid antigen tests to begin with for uh, detection of cases among symptomatic patients. And then if they are negative for antigen, then um, the, the person is uh, tested by PCR to pick up uh, any that um, the antigen test um, uh, did not uh, pick up. And, uh, and they've done very well um, uh, having uh, 80,000 cases reported, 60% of which were detected by antigen RDTs. And in doing so, save a lot of money and, uh, and be able to get results to everyone with a lot of speed so that um, uh, public health measures can be taken. So that's one really good example of how um, uh, a, a test that's less uh, sensitive can be used uh, to good effect. Now, I think we now seen that with uh, diagnostics as a, a uh, with rapid tests as a diagnostic tool, that's really important. Uh, but we also need to use um, uh, tests as a public health tool, especially to protect the vulnerable by screening healthcare workers and, and uh, health care home workers uh, to release from uh, quarantine, especially for travel, and a test to enable the reopening of schools and allow economic recovery. And then we also have self-tests that people could do at home if they are curious whether they have their results. But with antigen tests, the, there's also significant logistics and capacity constraints in terms of uh, being able to have enough trained personnel to do the antigen testing around the country as opposed to in, in a few labs. And so being able to perform the test correctly and to be able to have the data uh, reported in real time to co inform control measures is a, a, a big challenge for many countries uh, rolling out antigen tests. And so um, uh, what I like to say is that um, there's still a lot of countries uh, with different ways of uh, uh, testing uh, to save lives and livelihoods, because for many, um, uh, testing at workplaces, uh, testing at sports events, music events, at airports, and in Brazil, they use uh, pharmacies, uh, uh, the country has allowed uh, pharmacies to be able to do testing. Um, and also uh, the CDC has given very good um, a, a directions on how to use uh, testing in schools and colleges. But the fact remains that um, policymakers need to decide who to test, how frequently to test and what tests to use and where. And because we don't have time to do uh, randomized control trials, uh, quite often those uh, policy decisions are made based on modeling projections rather than uh, concrete evidence of effectiveness. And the Africa CDC, in their advice on how to use antigen tests, uh, wanted every country to establish very clear rules for both antigen and RT-PCR within their testing strategy and try to support uh, quality assurance, comprehensive training and supply management and uh, capturing the data. And so these are the CDC recommendations for use of antigen tests. And what I really like to just point out here is that the recommendation for uh, confirmation is that if you have an antigen test negative result in a person who is symptomatic, uh, then uh, you need to be able to con confirm uh, with a, a PCR or another antigen test. But amongst the people who are uh, less likely to test positive, that means in low prevalence settings, it's really important to not 
not to confirm the negative results, because in this case, you have a high negative predicted value, but to confirm positives. So that's the opposite of uh, in a symptomatic population. Confirming uh, the antigen positive results in a low preference setting is important because otherwise you, you may have uh, lots of false positives. So um, now with the variance concern, uh, there's a, a PATH website uh, that you could look up uh, whether the tests are affected by variance concern. And also uh, the US FDA has also given some advice as well. So in summary, I just like to say that uh, the COVID tests are really important, not only for clinical medicine, but as public health tools and now for surveillance, and that we need to make sure that we have not only equitable access to diagnostics, but data connectivity for visualization as well to guide uh, public health measures. Thank you. Thank you, Rosanna. So I'm gonna jump straight into the Q&A uh, since we have a couple of questions uh, from the audience. So, uh, Daniel, the first question is for you, uh, from Philippe, Philippe Jacon. Good to see you, Philippe. Uh, the question in the chat box, you can actually, the, the Q&A box, you can actually see, find is usually interested in the operational aspects of the tests, for example, for example, that is performance in the intended settings of use. Is it the case for COVID-19 tests? Yeah, thanks, Alex, and thanks, Philippe. Um, definitely is the case, and really, I think, you know, our, our challenge right now in the diagnostics, and Rosanna covered it very nicely, is not so much the, the R&D and the technology. We have some good um, uh, some good rapid antigen assays. We have some good other assays in different formats, but it, it's really the use cases. And one of the things that, as you know, um, Alex, in supporting LACTA and WHO and others is trying to really work through what are the use cases. And so how do we use the tools that we have in a very, in, in my view, a very localized way? I mean, we're, we're very focused on vaccination, of course, but it's going to be a long time until many low and middle income countries, unfortunately, really do have vaccination. So I think we're going to need to get the right use cases to drive down community to, to, into a community-based surveillance in, in a very actionable way. And so I think that's the really the next step. It's not so much about, okay, when is the next great antigen RDT come out? It's about how do we use this for maximum effect, especially in places where vaccination, at least wide-scale vaccination is not gonna be possible for some years and, and, and some degree of rapid operational research to, to build the evidence base on how this would be most effectively used in schools, border crossings, the things that Rosanna mentioned. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, the next question is also for you from Paulina. How often is fine planning to update the evaluation of the antibody tests in the context of, of variations of concern and general antibody waning in the population? Yeah, thanks, Paulina. Um, as you know, um, serology, I often joke about serology that it, it's um, uh, one half science and two thirds art. So it's a complicated field uh, to, to try to figure out. We haven't come to a specific answer. P perhaps Pauline, I know that you're, you know, you're, why you're interested in this and that we can maybe take that conversation offline. But um, I do think that just in general, not surprisingly, we're, we're seeing that uh, as we do get some of the world vaccinated and as this um, pandemic goes on, that a, a better evaluation of the sero status, which is not necessarily, incidentally, um, totally equivalent to the immune status of someone, but um, looking at serology to, to get an idea of exposure and perhaps to, to guide therapy and um, and to, to see what the immune status is to, to the extent that it gives us that is really one of the next steps. So we, we, we're thinking a lot about that at FIND and, and uh, don't have specifics, but I think that's one of the things on the horizon. Thanks, Daniel. I'm going to direct the next question to you, Rosanna. What are the challenges in diagnosis for post-COVID-19 infections? It's, it's really uh, a, a difficult, um, question to to answer you you mean like after someone has been uh, uh, confirmed as as a, a case and then um, they are reinfected um, is that what you meant um, Alex I don't know the question came from Martin 
Um, oh. So I, okay. I don't know. I don't have the clarification from him. Oh, okay. So, so uh, perhaps I'll, I'll I'll take it this way. Maybe is that um, uh, a person has been infected, but had passed the period of infectivity, and so where uh, PCR tests and and antigen tests are no longer uh, possible, you know, to to pick them up. And so, in in some of the algorithms in in some countries, what they do is if a sim uh, a person is symptomatic tests uh, uh, negative by molecular tests. And then when they were uh, 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 the tests, they were retested, still negative, uh, but because of other as, as presentations such as, um, you know, their X-ray and other, um, uh, I guess, signs and symptoms, they still uh, consider it a COVID uh, suspect case, then uh, we recommend they use antigen uh, antibody tests to confirm that the person had in fact uh, a past exposure to COVID. And, and that's the only way that we could manage these patients that are, um, maybe have long COVID and, uh, and, and they could be managed appropriately, but it's no longer to pick up uh, a case that is in, in potentially infectious, right? Yeah, I think that was the context that uh, Martin had in mind as well. So um, Daniel, I'll direct the next question to you. Uh, there are two questions from Zamira. One of them I'll allow you to answer directly because it's in reference to a, a fine publication. But the other one is, when is FIND uh, planning to conduct any field evaluation? And if yes, which country will be selected? And if there's any possibility to add countries, and uh, I believe the CA is Central Asia. There's also a, rel uh, a related question coming from McPaul uh, regarding the inclusion of Nigeria as one of the centers for diagnostic evaluation. So these are two related questions. Yeah, thanks, Alex, and thanks to the people posing the questions. Um, so the, they are they are related, as you say. You know, find we work with. Uh, an incredibly diverse number of partners around the world. Um, we, we do have country offices in various countries in, in India and, and South Africa and, and Vietnam and a few other places in, in Kenya. But um, we work with many different partners around the world. So it's not so much a kind of what sites find would individually set up. It's what sites would be um, logical to, to work with various partners who have that capacity. So um, we can we can explore that. And if the if the people who pose those questions would like to email me, we, we can give you more information. Um, with specific regard to Nigeria, we do have someone for, from FIND who's seconded to Nigeria CDC and based in Abuja and, and would be um, the liaison for um, potential collaborations with the Nigerian Reference Laboratory. So that would be the way to proceed there. Thanks, Daniel. We have less than two minutes left. So I have one last question for Rosanna. Uh, it's an easy question, Rosanna. It's from Mike Paul. Are there ways we could strategically build capacity of countries in Africa to contribute to the de novo diagnostics development? The majority of COVID 19 diagnostics have come from other continents. <laughs> Good luck. You have a minute and a half to answer that one. <laughs> yeah, um, actually, there there are several places uh, uh, in in Africa that have started to um, manufacture diagnostics, but they will also uh, be doing uh, development and evaluation uh, on the continent. As you know, the Africa CDC had started. Uh, a, a, uh, the initiative, the collaborative initiative to advance diagnostics. And within it, there is a, a component which is to try to be uh, locally sustainable in terms of medical products. And so the ambition is to have uh, diagnostics uh, both um, uh, imported as well as uh, locally um, sourced and, and also uh, hopefully developed. Um, and, and actually, Joe, uh, who's on our next panel, could um, could speak a little bit more about that as well, because he's involved in that uh, in at the Institute uh, Pastor Dakar. Thank you very much, Rosanna. Thank you very much, Daniel, as well, for the presentations. Uh, for those participants that joined later, we encourage you to use the Q&A uh, button or box at the bottom. 
And you can also vote on the questions which move them to the top of the list. Uh, so we're gonna move to part two. And uh, it's quite convenient that I already have Rosanna uh, on the screen because she's going to facilitate a round table which will focus on adapting regulatory requirements to facilitate, facilitate access to diagnostics. Um, Rosanna, the floor is yours and thank you very much again. Okay, um, thank you very much, Alex. So in this next session, we're trying to look uh, at how uh, re regulatory frameworks can facilitate access to diagnostics. Now, um, the purpose of having a, a regulatory framework is to ensure the quality and safety of uh, medical products. And but instead of viewing regulation as a barrier to access uh, to life-saving commodities, we like to discuss how regulation can also be an enabler of innovation and enabler of access to quality-assured uh, diagnostics. So with us today, we have four experts who are come from different fields to actually give us their point of view on, on this topic. And so the format of this uh, uh, roundtable is that we will ask each one of our four uh, panel members to uh, introduce themselves and uh, give us uh, uh, a few minutes on their view uh, uh, of the topic before we go into the uh, discussion uh, uh, portion of this um, session. And then we uh, have the last 15 minutes where we will open uh, for a Q and A from, from the audience. And so it's my pleasure uh, first to introduce uh, Joseph Benny, who's the head of medical devices at the Ghanaian FDA and an, uh, an alumnus of um, ACDX. Welcome, Joseph. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, um, my name is Benny. Uh, currently the head of the medical devices department for the Food and Rush Authority in Ghana. Um, basically when this um, COVID pandemic came up, um, we had some few challenges as a regulatory authority, um, especially when there was this lockdown, numbers were reduced um, we were unable to hold physical meetings as it were, and therefore it was a challenge even evaluating documentation of those years that were brought to us, sending um, samples to the lab for evaluation. But we went around this by first and foremost trying to decongest our various offices. So we had to divide the staff into sessions. So we have to run some shift system. We also have to start meeting remotely, virtual meetings as it were, um, doing evaluations from home, coordinating the meetings virtually, and ensuring that those documentations are effectively evaluated at the end of the day. We had our lab running again, um, various shift systems, 23 shifts in a day, to ensure that all applications are received are properly, adequately evaluated. Then we had to shift our whole uh, regulatory system into a, an emergency use authorization mode. So we had to look at applications that are brought to us under that um, principle, uh, emergency use authorization. So we had to kickstart that process. So most of the COVID-19 uh, kits that came were evaluated and approved based on the emergency use authorization. So some sessions of the processes had to be truncated, and then we had to facilitate the process. Eventually, we had most of these um, applications evaluated. We also have to establish a certain rapport with our la uh, external labs. Um, Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research and the National Health um, la uh, Reference Lab. So these two external labs assisted us most to have these uh, kits that were coming in evaluated. So eventually, under the emergency use authorization procedure, we were able to claim most of the, we had a lot of um, uh, COVID diagnosis test kits coming in, both PCR and RDTs coming in, 
antigen antibody test kits. So we have to go through almost all of this process within those uh, periods under those emergency conditions. But eventually we were able to uh, rise up to the situation in the sense that our staff, as I said, we had to develop, uh, uh, divide, divide ourselves into ship systems. We had to do this um, rotation, as it were, and do virtual meetings. Our regulatory meetings we could not even we could not even hold our regulatory meetings physically. So we have to adopt this virtual. The long and short of it is that we were able, under the circumstances, we learned that we need to move from the physical meetings, do these virtual meetings, and it helped us a lot. As of now, though the situation that is under control, we are still holding a lot of our meetings uh, virtually to ensure that uh, we are able to meet uh, the targets as it were. So uh, I'll pause Sorry. here and if there are any concerns I can see, yeah. I'll best with them. I'll okay. best them. Thank you, Benny. And, uh, and now I'd like to invite Pamela Gasper. Uh, who is a member of the Quality uh, Assessment Program for COVID testing in Brazil. Uh, Pamela, you have the floor. Thank you, Dr. Rosana and NCDEX committee for the invitation. It's an honor to be here. My name is Pamela Cristina Gaspar, as you said. I'm pharmaceutical biochemistry. I work as policymaker for around eight years, and I'm a member of the Brazilian COVID-19 Diagnostics Assessment Program that is an independent program that evaluates the tests, diagnostic tests available in Brazil in collaboration with public and private institutions. So today I'll talk about a little about how was the scenario of testing in Brazil before COVID-19 pandemic and how it is now during the pandemic. So before COVID-19 at the private sector, only clinical laboratories were allowed to perform tests and it, in, and it was necessary to have a laboratory responsible for any test that was performed outside of laboratory. And at the public sector, in the context of the Brazilian Unified Health System, that is our SUS tests were performed and, and is performed now in clinical laboratories and also immunochromatographic rapid tests were performed and it is now in healthcare units as primary level, also in community-based test settings, sites as places hard to reach. So when annually, the Ministry of Health distributes around 40 million rapid tests for HIV, syphilis, hepatitis B and C, and as key strategies for monitoring the quality of rapid diagnostic tests and results, I can mention periodic assessment of the test registers in the country, free distance learning course called Telelab, standard quality assessment for rapid diagnostic tests, and monitoring no conformity in tests. So we have here talk about clinical laboratories, primary level units, place hard to reach, but what about pharmacy and drug stores, which we have more than 88,000 units in Brazil. So due to the need to increase the, the access of quality tests at the beginning of the pandemic in Brazil in April, that was really the beginning, we start here around February and March, and Visa, that is our regulatory agency, uh, temporarily allowed pharmacies to perform monochromatographic rapid tests, even antibody or antigens one. As we just mentioned regarding STI rapid test in public sector, Anvisa also requires many obligations for all pharmacy that offers rapid test. So here I can list some of them as test registered in Anvisa, good pharmacy practice, pharmacies is the only profession that can perform the test in pharmacies, compulsory notification of cases and postmark surveillance. The Brazilian COVID-19 Diagnosis Assessment Program already analyzed more than 50 different tests and the results helps the pharmacy to choose the test according to the best performance for antibody or even more now for antigen test. So until now, we have around 10 million tests performed by pharmacies uh, with more than 2 million positive results. Regarding these results, 26% was for an antigen test. So one, uh, four, uh, one in four people tested for an antigen was positive. And a young adult was re between 18 to 39 years was the population more reached by 
this initiative. So as a quick conclusion, I can say that we have a lot to improve, but it's evident that Brazil has accelerated the process of testing pharmacy due to COVID. So we know that it should not be easy to expand the pharmacy test because we still face a lot of resistance in the country, but we have also many professional institutions that have already been advocating this for many and many years. And now the population knows even more this technology. And for sure, they will pressure more and more for availability of testing near their homes with quick results. So we keep the faith and work hard together to achieve testing access for all with college and safety. That is the most important. Thank you. And I'm excited for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. That's a really good um, uh, demonstration of how uh, a country can, you know, quickly uh, use the pharmacies to increase access. So now I'd like to call upon uh, uh, Dr. Sydney Yi from Singapore uh, to give her introduction. Uh, Sydney. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Rosanna. Um, and thank you, ACDEX, for the invitation. Um, my name is Sydney Yi. Uh, I'm the CEO of uh, Diagnostics uh, Development Hub or DXT Hub in Singapore. So DXT Hub is a uh, product development and uh, production engine. We would like to call it a productization engine. Uh, we work with uh, both uh, public and private organizations. Our model is to co-invest with our partners in product development lifecycle and share the upside in the market delivery. So we take uh, everything from innovations all the way through to production to market deployment. Uh, I also uh, have a uh, capacity as uh, the co-chair for the ASEAN Diagnostics Initiative. Uh, ASEAN Diagnostics um, in Initiative is a platform endorsed by ASEAN leadership in 2018 with the purpose of capability development. Um, so leveraging the productization engine of DXC Hub to deliver uh, innovation um, diagnostics um, to um, Southeast Asia. Uh, also capacity building, sharing our best practices. How do we strengthen our network, research network with our ASEAN partners? Um, for example, recently we just got funded um, to do a uh, ASEAN-wide zero surveillance study on COVID-19 vaccines for the 10 ASEAN countries. Uh, so when it comes to transforming innovations to diagnostic solutions, um, regulatory and adoptions are the two central themes throughout the whole product development life cycle. Uh, generally, the life cycle is guided through four phases. Uh, we go through needs findings, uh, basically looking at uh, connecting the ideation, the product, the project origination, connecting the problem statement to the solutions, uh, as well as then the next phase of conceptualization. How do we distill idea into product form factor? Um, then the third phase of productization and finally commercialization, making the test accessible to the market. Um, so as early as the second phase of conceptualization, when we're looking at distilling ideas into product form factor, we already need to consider very early on the regulatory, regulatory and adoption uh, requirements. Adoption in terms of what are the use cases? I think a couple of the speakers, Daniel and Rosanna talked a lot about the use cases. Uh, the use cases, especially something that would translate into actionable clinical next steps, how the test fits into the end-to-end uh, -end, uh, workflow, clinical workflow, uh, who's running it, who's paying for it, and who's using it. Uh, that actually helps us frame the whole um, product, um, how it needs to look like, that whole product form factor that would then guide us into regulatory strategy in the next phase of productization. Um, regulatory requirements really is uh, uh, always going to be fundamentally driven by evidence. So uh, in productization, we always start with the analytical performance, performance to look at uh, first and foremost the safety, whether the test is actually testing accurately what it's supposed to be testing, uh, looking at uh, precision, whether it is reproducible, whether between the different operator, it can uh, be repeatable and also looking, looking at cross-reactivity uh, for something like a SARS-CoV-2, uh, we wanna know that the test is not going to cross-react with another human coronavirus. Um, and because it is a respiratory uh, virus, we also wanna know that it's not going to cross-react with another respiratory virus. Uh, so looking at that and also looking at 
uh, the effectiveness, really how the result is going to relate directly to a clinical condition um, and of course stability. So in the pandemic, a lot of allowance has been made in uh, uh, different requirements of regulatory uh, safety in a risk uh, balance way, uh, especially in requirements that will take the longest time. Uh, things like, for example, um, uh, stability. Stability, instead of uh, uh, having to do a real-time stability, we're looking at accelerated stability and to be supplemented by real-time stability data after it's been approved and uh, being uh, used in the market. And clinical validation in terms of uh, moderating the size of the, the cohort that's required to get a test uh, approved. Um, so in the final stage of commercialization, when the test is actually um, going to be deployed, regulatory continues to be crucial uh, in post-market uh, monitoring. And it also plays a role in adoption especially in terms of a lab-based test. Uh, there are uh, regulatory requirements also for deployment labs, labs that will be therefore motivated by really more use cases because the use cases would drive the market. So this is where it, you know, it becomes really important, uh, the reason why we need to consider use cases very, very early on when we think about when we start doing product development. So basically to accelerate um, accessibility of tests to market, it is important to ensure that uh, we consider regulatory and adoption issues as early as possible um, when we're doing product development. Thank you. Thank you, Sydney. I, I think that's a really good model on um, how a test could uh, be you know, marketed a lot sooner than, than they are now. And so um, our last uh, panel member is uh, uh, Joe Fitchett. And Joe, you could introduce yourself because you've just moved uh, across another to another continent <laughs> to start a new job. And so um, Joe, go ahead. Rosanna, thank you. Um, my name is Dr. Joe Fitch. I'm a medical director at Melogic, uh, but outgoing at the moment and joining the Institut Pasteur de Dakar, where I'll be part of the new delivery unit, which is involved in the scale up of diagnostic and therapeutic and vaccine countermeasures for, for epidemics. And very keen to come and share some of our experience at Melogic, in particular in partnership with the Institut Pasteur de Dakar around technology transfer. And I'm pleased to see some of the scientists, Umar and Jai and others from the Institute online as well for questions. Just looking to the next slide. Um, thank you very much. Here, this slide really demonstrates two important variables over the last year or so. Uh, it's capturing the timelines of emergency use listing by WHO as a signal uh, of intent and interest in deploying tests in low and middle income countries. But it also shows some of the evaluations by FIND and the tests that exceed the 85% preferred or 80% minimum threshold set out by the target product profile by WHO. And really there's a couple of lessons from this. Uh, firstly, June was the official launch for a call for EUL, uh, for antigen detection after many nucleic acid uh, tests for SARS-CoV-2 were approved very quickly, um, as you can in many ways with a technology platform of PCR. And as soon as October 2020, we see the first two emergency use listings. These are nasopharyngeal swabs in their first round. And you can see thereafter public data coming through um, along the find evaluation repository, which you can access online. And over the period of 2021, many, many tests meeting this preferred criteria and exceeding the minimum criteria in these trials. What's important here is um, that mismatch, which Dan Bausch was talking about a bit earlier around the, the tiny number of approvals that have been seen in the last year. We're still on emergency use listing. We're still in a pandemic as it grows and grows. And we're still seeing the major bulk of cases now shifting to low middle income countries. But only 1%, just over 1% of uh, antigen tests that have regulatory approval of some kind, CE marking through to something more stringent, have been approved. And whilst many tests may not 
benefit from a quality that is required for deployment, it is, it is likely that more than 1% of tests are high performance or higher quality. And so there's an opportunity here um, to standardize the evaluations across sites to better resource pre-qualification and better resource groups like FIND doing these independent trials and move away from duplication um, of trials through to better trials on the intended use. And in this case, you can see the shift to nasal swabbing, which has been deemed preferable overall. Um, looking to the next slide, the other challenge that we've seen, of course, has been politics and interference in science. I've had a front row seat of that in the United Kingdom, where you can see here in regulation, the staff at the UK medicines regulator, respected regulator, are set for budget cuts. A quarter of staff will be made redundant. And this is despite the unit not having commanded any additional resource for COVID. It was using its own resources for vaccines, therapeutics, and, and diagnostics. So whilst less regulation is polit politically attractive, um, and whilst, as we saw on the previous slide, it is unlikely that 1% of, of, of manufacturers have a, have a high quality test, it's likely more, um, we do need to protect the public and elevate the technology through, through meaningful commitment and, and investment. And the message I'd like to end on where we're seeing some real progress on that is, for example, in the ECOWAS region. West African Health Organization, in collaboration with the Ghana FDA and others, are looking to harmonize regulatory approval of tests. And that is becoming very attractive given the local, national, regional production that is being built in the ECOWAS countries. And look forward to seeing how that approach might be one way of being an enabler to facilitate access in LMICs. Thank you, Rosanna. Thank you, Joe. And, and so I'd like to uh, begin the, the panel discussion by asking you, the, um, uh, all of the panel members, uh, for your views on um, something that, uh, that Joe talked about, uh, which is, um, you know, try to reduce the number of uh, duplications of uh, evaluations of tests. And in, and, and in this pandemic, because we have so many tests, um, whether we could sort of um, divide up the load between uh, different organizations, who could we trust uh, to do it? Uh, because we, we cannot have every country trying to duplicate all the evaluations that everybody else is doing. And there is no real central way to know who's doing what at any one point. And so, um, uh, I, I think there are some countries, a few countries that have, you know, uh, in, it, for example, in Africa, uh, the East uh, African community have started to harmonize their regulation of medicines uh, a few years ago and, and uh, poised to, to do the same for diagnostics. Uh, but has that worked um, uh, well or not? And whether in in uh, in Asia, uh, the Asian Harmonization Working Party, uh, do you think uh, is working on that? And and also Pamela could uh, comment on what happens in Latin America in terms of um, trying to have more harmonization, more regulatory reliance uh, on WHO or fines uh, evaluation and less duplication in countries. Um, so who wants to start first? Uh, Benny? Yeah, you... okay. Yes, um, within the West African um, region, WAHO has started something um, in terms of harmonizing uh, regulatory procedures. Recently, we received an application um, from Senegal and it is going through that process. So if one country within the sub-region evaluates and approves it, then it is easier for it to move within the sub-region. So that harmonization is ongoing. That reliance system is also being uh, propagated. So gradually we are getting there. Um, what we received was a, a COVID-19 test kit that uh, Ghana is leading in the evaluation currently. So once Ghana does it, um, and it is approved. The other countries within the West Africa sub region are most likely to just adopt it. And so that 
collaboration is ongoing, that harmonization process is ongoing. And um, we are willing also to learn from other systems in terms of this collaboration and this, in terms of this reliance system. So we are open to, to, to that. And I think Wahoo championing it, it will be a good thing eventually for the whole of the West Africa subregion. I don't know how that can be replicated in other blocks within Africa, but like we said, East, East Africa is doing something, and I believe the other blocks within Africa will also be taking it up. Okay. And, and, uh, and Pamela, I know that uh, regulatory reliance uh, is, is a big uh, thing that is happening uh, for, um, you know, all the uh, uh, Latin America countries. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, Dr. Zana, here uh, in Brazil for COVID-19 in the beginning, and Visa used a lot of reliance uh, because we did not have enough time to, to, to do the evaluation of the test. So there are some institution and organization that uh, the Visa could authorize the reliance and we used the temporary registration. So we registered for one year and after that, the industry has to show the complete uh, documents and uh, testing for the definitive registration for 10 years. So it really helps to have the technology really quick in Brazil. And, and we have the coalition for Latin America that we are trying to harmonize our regulation process. Uh, so at least we have some really uh, that is uh, that can be sharing between the countries and really facilitate the regulatory of the test. But this is for COVID for now. So we start with that. That, that and, would be and then we it'll be really good for use for the another. Yeah, yeah. Disease. And Cindy, yeah, Cindy, could you comment on Asia uh, in in terms of AHWP, the Asian Harmonization Working Party, and or ASEAN? Uh, or APEC, it, you know, there are so many um, different organizations that have different point of view in terms of trade, economy, etc. But um, I, I think this crosses all their jurisdictions, right? Yeah. Uh, so you know, harmonization is always a sensitive uh, topic. Um, uh, so maybe I'll, uh, so for for Southeast Asia. Um, we do have um, not so much a harmonization in terms of initial recognition, but harmonization of documentation. So Southeast Asia and the ASEAN countries actually do use the same set of documentations in terms of regulatory filing. Mm -hmm. um, so that would um, uh, that kind of form an, a bridge um, a registration process. Um, in the pandemic uh, uh, between Singapore and the Philippines, um, the Philippines FDA actually uh, has a direct recognition of the, um, the provisional authorization um, from uh, the Singapore HSA. So we see that uh, as maybe something that we can learn from um, this pandemic. And we are in the process of, uh, uh, you know, trying to get the, 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 the regulatory authorities of the ASEAN countries um, to get together. Uh, not so much to talk about the harmonization and mutual recognitions, but more to look at um, uh, on the ground operationally, what are the, you know, how do we review, uh, what, are, uh, what are our practices in terms of reviewing the uh, mm -hmm. registration packages? Um, and hoping that uh, we take this opportunity to get together and to share that best practices. And it could be that, because in a lot of Southeast Asian countries, um, it, 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 well, regardless of whether you have regulatory approval, there is a reference lab in the country that actually needs to repeat and run, um, evaluate the test. So it could be that we can also set up some sort of a, a mutual, mutually recognized labs Mm -hmm. that can run those uh, uh, tests that can accelerate the, the process. So these are the different things that we're thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and Joe, I, I think in, in, your, in your position uh, uh, in, from a company's point of view, um, how, how is, has it, how, what's your view on, on this in terms of, um, um, you know, some some companies told me that actually the harmonization created more paperwork and more delays and more expensive procedures. And so um, how can we make it work? I, th I think one way to make it work is, 
you know, the moment we're actually seeing, for example, just taking a nasal sample, six, at least six kits evaluated by fine that have been pre-selected on, on being the most promising. And out of many, many hundreds of other developers were competing for very um, overlapping supply chain, the prices are going up, prices of plastic and prices of, of reagents. And whilst it's a very positive thing to see so much innovation, there is little that is spoken about uh, the downsides of having so many um, mm -hmm. companies in the market. So that's where something that regulation could pop potentially assist with, which is flagging the materials that are more eco-appropriate, that are flagging the suppliers that can provide um, cost-assured, quality-assured mm -hmm. components, particularly in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, would help regulators too, because they will see similar materials, they will see similar providers, and they will know the quality standards of those. So you're, mm -hmm. you're kind of regulating uh, that collaboration and competition. Yeah. Paperwork is a huge burden, but of course, it's very much needed. And one you know, example, uh, which the WHO and final process has demonstrated, is SD Biosensor have uh, an, an EUL for nasopharyngeal testing, but unlike PanBio, where they moved very quickly to an EUL for nasal one month after in November last year, mm -hmm. um, evaluations haven't supported that claim. Mm -hmm. um, and so we really do need regulation to be in place. And, and the UK approach is not going to be, I think, appropriate everywhere yeah. around the world. Yeah. So I, yeah, I, I, I'd like to um, bring another point, which is that one of the ways that we think that um, uh, the right, you know, access to products could be a lot faster if we could actually, um, uh, we, we could actually have um, a, the conversation with policymakers about, you know, adoption, just like Sydney said, the earlier you consult with policymakers about um, uh, the use, who, who will pay, who, you know, all that uh, can figure it into the product development earlier on. Um, and, and so, but, is there such a forum in in different countries for doing that, right? Um, you know, in trying to figure out the how regulators need to be consulting with policymakers on how good is good enough. Would we be using this kind of test? Would this test actually fit into the context of our country? I mean, that's something that. Um, we're trying to do, we're funded by the Wellcome Trust to try and, uh, you know, bring regulators and policymakers together. But they, they, they speak different languages and, and it's so hard to get them together. Uh, I see Benny <laughs> smiling. Um, so Benny, in, in Ghana, um, do you talk with regulators, uh, uh, the regulators talk with uh, policymakers uh, frequently? Yes, um, there's currently a forum um, led by the Ministry of Health. Indeed, uh, the regulatory body is part of the Ministry of Health. There's a forum that is um, organized by the Ministry of Health, and it includes other um, agencies, including the research institutions, including um, the tertiary, the universities, let me put it that way, and the teaching hospitals. The idea is to get a common ground as to what should be used and if it is to be used, who is supposed to be funding that. Um, mm -hmm. Currently, the government pays, most of this, uh, pays for most of these tests that are conducted. Um, some few uh, private institutions also contribute, but government basically uh, provides a funding for this. But that cannot be sustainable over a long period. So yeah. there's always a need for private sector uh, injection of funds to ensure that. So this discussion, conversation is currently going on between the regulators, the ministry, in terms of finding a way of who foots that bill and who pays for mm -hmm. it. There, there, there are goodwill from the private sector also has to contribute. And that discussion, I must say, is currently ongoing. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, money is always the bottom line. It I, is I think, always a problem. <laughs> I think um, in Asia, um, um, uh, Sydney, you, you already have this such a forum, right? And and in fact, for, for you in Singapore, you provide this kind of forum to bring, uh, you know, innovators together with regulators and policymakers, right? Is, is it working well? And who's funding that? 
Yeah, so, uh, so, so you're right. Actually, uh, DXC Hub uh, does provide that platform to do that. Um, it's, uh, it's, it, but actually, in terms of the, the speed, um, it's, uh, it, it's worked very well in terms of uh, asking the questions um, as early as possible and uh, talking to the regulators. And uh, um, so we do start that process of talking to the regulators uh, very, very early. Um, the policy, talking to the policymakers is... Uh, it, um, you know, something that we do rather uh, uh, indirectly, as in uh, we would uh, uh, do that by working with the, um, the healthcare delivery system. Because mm. at the end of the day, the policymakers, the Ministry of Health actually would, the framework actually regulates what the healthcare delivery system uh, will adopt. Mm. Um, mm. So we approach it more from the uh, lowering the barrier to adoption. Uh, okay. What does it take for a doctor to pay for the test, for example? Um, so the model that we take is very much a co-investment model. So we mm -hmm. co-investment with uh, uh, whether it is public or private sector. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, because we are a public sector organization, so we can't take the market risk. So at some point in time in that uh, product development life cycle, we need to already bring in a commercial partner to co-invest in, yeah. in that development process. Yeah, and, and Pamela, I know that the coalition uh, for uh, regulatory convergence and reliance, that, uh, do, you th do you think that's working well? And, and who's funding that? Is it a, a contribution from different countries that are in the coalition? Yes, Dr. Reza, I think that it's contribution a lot because it's really will help. And uh, yes, it is a contribution from all the countries. And uh, as, a, as a policymaker, I can say that uh, we have a really close relation with the regulatory agency, that it's our Envisa. But I think that we have a, a lot more to improve that, uh, being as a systematic uh, uh, is a systematic process. So we really need to get close with our regulator even even more to, to define who to test, how to test. And especially we we really are close to them after the, the trash is available in Brazil. And we really need to get more in contact to say what we need and how how is the the specificity and sensitivity and the characteristic of the test. So I think that a lot of things was already done and we are much better than we were before regarding this subject. Yeah, great. And so, um, so, so Joe, this is, this is all happening uh, with regard to um, uh, what's happening in, you know, d uh, different countries and, and different continents. Um, do you think for, uh, for Africa that, process, um, you know, in terms of catching up with Asia and, and Latin America, in terms of the policy makers and regulators getting together, um, other than, you know, what, what Benny has uh, described in, you know, there are 55 countries, right, in, in Africa. It, it, you see that as a daunting task. Should it be regional in within Africa rather than one Africa um, sort of forum? What do you think? Well, what's exciting about where we are at the moment is countries are building their own capacity to develop tests. And it's to one of the questions in the Q&A. You know, the R&D is happening now on, on priorities for surveillance in Africa. Mm -hmm. And so the more we can you know, elevate sites that want to do that work, that want to produce, that want to do it at the quality that is necessary anywhere, um, I think the better we can engage with the policymakers and the regulators and, and ensure we lift all boats. Because some priorities in Senegal or in other countries in Ghana, elsewhere, may not be shared in, in the same priority in another setting. So we do need that network. Um, what we have an opportunity to do at the moment is, however, um, define what that regulatory framework might look like for these new priorities. We certainly cannot have a situation again in the next pandemic where, you know, agreed draft target product profiles are published in September yeah. and uh, yeah. public health emergency sent in January. So there's work we can do ahead of time to develop target product profiles and, and 
there's no reason why the African Union couldn't start many of that process. Um, and also there is um, there are new models for deployment and adoption. Certainly at Melogic, the attempt there was to convert a private company into a not-for-profit. So Melogic is no longer a, a private company. It's a social enterprise. Any profits is reinvested into R&D and production. And therefore, it can be agnostic to its own products. And in fact, we have been. We can make anyone's products as long as they meet the WHO standard. And this is, I think, a model that could be explored in the regions for the regional priorities mm -hmm. so that you reduce the price and secure the supply chain. Thank you. So we'd like to uh, open now uh, for Q&A from, from the audience. Sandra, do, do we have um, some questions? I haven't been paying attention to the Q&A box, sorry, <laughs> Sandra. No problem, Rosanna, thank you. So we have uh, um, one uh, question for Joseph Denis on uh, how long does the registration procedure by FDA Ghana take? Penny, okay. are you? Yeah, okay. Yeah, before we started um, using the uh, adopting the emergency use authorization, normally it would have taken uh, about six months, but this has been drastically reduced to about between a month to two months, maximum three months, we should be out of it. Uh, approval should have been given. That's great, yeah. Um, is that clear enough? I hope that is clear enough. Before the before we started using the emergency use authorization uh, protocol, we were doing about six months, and now we are doing less than six months. Within three months, we should be able to have that approved. And and so. And so you've you've um, uh, tell me how you've managed to reduce the time. Is it uh, reducing the complexity or using more of other people's data, like WHO data or whatever? Yeah, we we are able to use data that is supplied by the applicant. We are also able to assess WHO data, and we are also able to use data from the research institutions that we have currently here, mm. and then based on that pull all those resources together, we are able to do, and, and then once that is done, you then take your time to do a, a, a more a analysis subsequently. You mm -hmm. allow the approval, and then you do a post-approval evaluation to ensure that if there are any other issues, you take care of them. But mm -hmm. you do that quickly within the th first three months, then after that, if there are any issues, you take care of them subsequently. Okay. So you don't so demand I even a lot of documentation from applicants. Um, once we've done the approval, subsequently, if there are any issues, you raise them with the applicant and deal with that. Sandra, are there other questions in the um, Q&A? Another, another question regarding um, uh, WHO regions. Should, should we have uh, every w, should each WHO region have one independent regulatory institution with the mission to evaluate and validate diagnostics, or should we accept a product already validated by an international regulatory institution? Mm, that's a that's a good question for for everyone to answer. Uh, let's start with the reverse order. Uh, Joe, what do you think? I missed the question. Can you say it again? So the question is, should every WHO region have one independent regulatory institution with mission to evaluate and validate diagnostics, or should we accept a product already validated by an international regulatory institution? Vicky, because I've seen, the, I've seen the variability in sites, you know, even the same test across, say, the fine sites in Peru and in India and in Germany and Switzerland, they can be different. Um, certainly what I think is the reg independent regulatory institutions should be broader than a central hub. I think there's a value in having a central hub, but we need to share the load according to those standards, whether it's by region or by continent, I don't know. Okay, um, Sydney, what do you think? 
Um, so uh, I, I actually agree with Joe, is that there needs to be a balance because uh, so DXC have actually, uh, so we play that role. Um, so uh, all the diagnostics coming into Singapore, actually, we, we evaluate um, and we validate that. And so we see huge variation um, and a lot of discrepancy in terms of what's playing and what is the actual performance. Um, it's, so I, I think we need to actually uh, uh, sort of balance the speed versus uh, safety um, and quality mm -hmm. of the product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and Pamela, you must see a lot of, I, I know there's a huge network of labs uh, doing independent evaluations of different tests. Um, do you see a variation in terms of, you know, the, uh, the performance of the same tests across different labs? And yes, that's within the country, right? Let alone yes. different countries. Yeah, yeah. Yes, even yeah. if the country. So I really agree with Joe and Sydney, but it is very important at least to get really close, at least the regions like Latin America, Asia that has close characteristics. Yeah. So one, one of the things that I, I like to say is that it, very early on in the FIND website, we see that, um, uh, say, for example, one of the tests, that, uh, antigen tests that was evaluated, uh, if you look at the threshold of, that WHO has put in terms of the target product profile of 80% sensitivity against PCR and 97% specificity against PCR, one product, one antigen test actually uh, failed in Germany in the, you know, in the fine evaluation, but passed in Brazil. So, so my, you know, I, I thought, well, how can countries interpret that to know whether they should adopt the test or not, right? Because it, it failed in one and passed in the other. And, and so this brings up the whole issue of not having standardized panels, because I think that um, in some uh, jurisdictions, the panels are full of um, uh, specimens that have very high viral loads, in which case the, the test would pass very easily. But in another jurisdiction where um, the specimens have lower viral load, the, the performance would come out a lot lower than the other site, right? So I think it speaks to the importance of everybody agreeing to a standardized panel um, in, in as closely as possible in terms of viral load for antigen detection, et cetera, right? Uh, so I, I think we do need to have few um, data, but it's it's really uh, confusing for countries, uh, policymakers to choose when you have evaluation data that um, for the same tests that vary from site to site. Joe, you. I was going to agree on the, on that standardization. There have been some good academic papers, but they haven't necessarily been, you know, widely comparative. Comparative. Um, the other two aspects that perhaps need to be included better in the assessment, certainly for the next pandemic, are, you know, the health technology assessments around cost benefit. Mm -hmm. Certainly in yeah. the UK, a PCR is 28, 30 pounds per patient. A, a rapid test should be under three pounds, two pounds. Um, and the ones that we're seeing are performing very well, the next generation tests, let's say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there needs to be, I think, better work there yeah. globally. And also on eco-appropriate materials, because, um, certainly, we've initiated some work um, around understanding the, the downsides of rapid testing in plastics, like malaria tests, pregnancy tests, yeah. COVID tests. However, the, the carbon footprint of laboratories is extremely high. And, and everyone on the call that works in the laboratory, of course, knows just how high that is. But very little work has been done to compare it. So the longer we wait with this backlog, mm -hmm. um, the longer we have these adjacent, potentially negative externalities, both on the population health basis, but also on the cost and environmental basis at a time of crisis. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And, and with that, I think we've um, uh, come to the end of our uh, session on the regulatory framework to facilitate access to diagnostic tests. And uh, I'd like to thank all the panel members for very interesting uh, discussion and, uh, and the audience for, for the questions. And with that, I'd like to hand over back to Alex. 
Thanks, Rosanna. You were right on time. Thank you very much to the panelists and to the participants who asked questions as well. I invite the panelists, in fact, to look at the additional questions that might be in the, in the Q&A box and answer them directly if you would like. So we're going to move to the third and last part of uh, this uh, webinar. And this last session will focus on strengthening genomic sequencing capacity and surveillance strategies for detecting a virus variants. It's needless to say how important this has become with the constant emergence of uh, variations of concern. Um, and also the fact that this virus uh, is becoming endemic and such variants will continue to emerge as long as vaccination rates and coverage remain low in parts of the world. Um, so our first presentation, will discuss laboratory capacity strengthening for genomic sequencing in low and middle income countries, which will be presented by Jared uh, Mboa, who's an implementation science expert for bioinformatics at the Africa CDC. Jared, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Costa. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I hope I'm loud and clear. So I wish to discuss the laboratory capacity that has been set up, especially in Africa, for genomic sequencing in the introduction, following the introduction of the SARS-CoV-19 in the continent. Okay. This. Okay, so sorry about that. So, introduction of science and the continent and beyond. This slide shows you the scale of that are so far based on the continent. And what you can see here is there are variations in the number of genomes that have been sequenced from each yeah. of these cases. So, what you can see here is you have Africa here in position number four, having sequenced 0.5% of the cases that have been detected. So, scale and an urgent, an urgent need to wrap up the sequencing of the variants of concern or the genomes themselves that have been detected in, in the different parts of the world. And like you have from the PS, each of these diagnostic tools as a issue. Many different vendors were working to identify the diagnostics. So this year I was identified as the gold standard, and we all know people who are traveling that antigen tests may not be acceptable. Results of that test may not be acceptable in some parts of the world, and there is a PCR. So at the moment, PCR test is the diagnostic. However, it has also limitations, especially at the time when there is a vaccine, but of vaccinating, they still have increasing of cases. So it is very important to try to identify what kind of genes or what kind of SARS-CoV virus even in the presence of the times when vaccination is trying to increase. And logically, it is expected that the numbers should be going. Next slide. Okay. Jared, uh, sorry to okay. interrupt you. Uh, All right. May I ask you, your connection is a bit broken. May I ask you to switch off your video? Perhaps okay. uh, we can improve the audio. Okay, let me do that. Thanks. All right, welcome. Okay. So about that, my question is slow. So in Africa, what you can see is before the SARS-CoV-19, this is a publication that had been published in 2019 that was trying to document the NGS capacity, the presence of the next generation sequencing capacity on the continent. And what you can see from here is a few countries had the next, gen the next generation sequencing in Africa. And this is like what we have seen before is very important in trying to, the presence of the next generation sequencing capacity is very important in trying to, to sequence or to actualize the prevalent, the prevalent 
SARS-CoV genomes in each of these countries. So here, what you can see is some countries had fairly better capacity of the next generation sequencing. When you look at South Africa, Kenya, and then Morocco here, you see they relatively have fairly many numbers or increasing number of sequencing capacity. So what happened is when the, 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 there was an increase in the number of cases being in Africa, Africa CDC worked with these different hubs or the, the different countries that had a fairly increased capacity for sequencing to try to establish modalities that will enable countries that lack the sequencing capacities to collect samples and ship them to these facilities so that they can be sequenced with the facilitation from Africa CDC. So that is key. So what Africa CDC has done in the, in, in the process, it has tried to build a network of countries that send samples for sequencing in each of these hubs, as you can see. So the network collects samples from these countries that are unable to perform whole genome sequencing. And then these samples are collected alongside the metadata that is relevant for, for, for the, the testing itself. And then they are shipped to those hubs that have the capacity to perform whole genome sequencing. So we have a network of about 25, about 22 labs currently that are doing this kind of sequencing all over Africa for 55 member states. And then also these sequencing hubs are able to perform the bioinformatics analysis to make sure they can send back the results to these member states in time to inform public health interventions. So this is the work of the labs that I'm talking about. We have highly specialized sequencing labs. That is the one in Nigeria, then South Africa, and then Chris has so in Africa we have two. So these are the highly specialized sequencing hubs that are receiving samples from these countries that are unable to, to perform whole gene sequencing. So down here we have also what we call the regional COVID sequencing laboratories, which you can see here that they are also helping to try to perform whole genome sequencing for each of the, me the member states, as you can see here. So you can see that this is the network that Africa CDC has tried to set up. So that it is in a position to ensure that we have capacity to perform whole genome sequencing in Africa. So looking into what the, the sequencing capacity has done, so here we have a map of Africa that shows the countries that are under this network. So the deep blue here, you can see those are the participating countries under the network. And then what you see in yellow, these are countries that are not participating in this network, and there are about five. So you can see that the network has a good number of representation of African, African countries. And so far by July, this, by 5th July this year, about 14,000 SARS-CoV samples had been shipped and then sequenced from these participating member states. Okay, so I've already talked about this. So looking at the past eight months, you can see there has been a sharp increase in the number of genomes that have been sent from Africa, but also shared on the global portal, that is the GSAID, where SARS-CoV genomes are being shared by different states all over the world. So you can see that the role of Africa CDC has been noticeable starting generally this year. And up to now, we report about 40,000 genomes that have been sequenced and shared in the GSID portal. So this is the distribution of how these samples have been contributed. Out of the 40,000, you can see what countries are submitting more than 1,000 samples, and then between 100 and 1,000, and then the no samples, you can also see them here. So this is how the network has tried to, to perform when it comes to sharing and sequencing the SARS-CoV sam samples from different parts of in Africa. So this is the statistics of how the different countries have also managed to, 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 to document the variation and the variance of concern. Here you can see the average contribution from Africa. We have about 200 SARS-CoV genomes being uploaded on GCID portal every day from Africa. 
and we have about 1.2% of the GSAID SARS genomes being from Africa currently. However, only 0.5% of over the 8 million SARS-CoV cases that have been reported in Africa have been sequenced. That's a small percentage, as you can see. And then we have 48 member states from out of the 55 African countries uh, reporting at least one variant of concern. And the average turnaround time from sample collection to submission of the, the genomes on GSAID is about six weeks for most of the African samples. And then we have 26 member states uh, able to provide SARS-CoV genomes every month to the GSAID portal. So these are the other statistics. 43 member states have reported the beta variant of concern. 37 have reported alpha, 36 have reported delta, and then two have reported the gamma variant. So here, looking at what the dynamics of the variants of concerns are, here looking at the green is the fraction or the proportion of the delta variant of concern. And you can see that it is changing the picture of SARS-CoV in Africa. So that is an extraction of about eight countries from Africa that are trying to have routine contribution of SARS-CoV genomes. But you can clearly see that almost 80% of the, the samples are now Delta variants starting July this year. So we have challenges and opportunities. Having looked at the network that has been set up by Africa CDC, there are challenges that we have met along the way. One is the inadequate about infrastructure and the human resource. As you understand, compared to the antigen tests, which are very maybe I, I may use the word basic, they can easily be implemented in the field and in many hospital settings. Whole genome sequencing is not easily implemented. Even laboratories that had capacity for PCR may not easily implement whole genome sequencing. So we had a lot of support from Illumina and Oxford Nanopore in trying to distribute different sequencing platforms in Africa. However, you can see still that wasn't enough that this laboratory capacity had to cope with this introduction of the sophisticated technologies. Also the sampling and representativeness of the samples that are being sequenced. This is one of the challenges that Africa CDC has been working on. And last month, they tried to publish an interim guide on how to sample different samples for whole genome sequencing. For example, if I give you a scenario like maybe in Kenya, where in a week they may be detecting about 2,000 samples, positive cases, picking out what samples may be a priority for sequencing can be a little bit of a challenge because in some cases you have contu different contributions from Nairobi, then maybe Kenya contributes about 200 out of those. So that is a challenge that Africa CDC has tried to address by publishing an interim guided document to guide sampling. The bioinformatics expertise is still an issue and how we are overcoming that is to try to organize uh, trainings. Many of them have been virtual and we know the bioinformatics training may not easily be achieved through a virtual kind of training. And many countries are, are, have been enforcing lockdowns and restrictions on movement. So it hasn't been very easy on our side to try to train different people from different countries in bioinformatics. Then also looking at that network that is shipping a number of samples across the continent. Africa is a huge continent and uh, this has not been easy in many cases where some countries are even inaccessible by uh, road transport or even air transport. A country like Congo is an example where you may not be in a position to, to try to get a good representation of samples from each of the different parts of the country. So delays have been there that affect even the integrity of the samples and also uh, the time to, 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 to take in from collection to sequencing, which is a big issue on the quality of the data. Also, there has been some challenges regarding the NGS reagent supply chains. Many of these are coming in from Illumina in California and some from the EU. 
different parts of EU. So this has not been easy as we have seen. Some countries have been having total lockdowns, even going as far as closing the air transport. So that has affected the capacity even within the sequencing hubs to keep sequencing amidst this challenge. Also, the costs of shipment have been a little bit high, $23 US dollars per sample is pretty high looking at what we have been paying. So that is also a challenge that Africa CDC is facing when it comes to, to just shipping and moving these samples to the sequencing hubs. And it also affects, the delays also affect the sample integrity like we have already seen. Uh, and in general, South America, Asia, and Africa have each sequenced less than 1% of their SARS-CoV cases. And this is very important because as we continue to ramp up vaccination, we realize that the cases may be increasing in some cases, and these cases may not be in position to, to, to understand what the nature of the variants continue to be prevalent amidst the vaccination. I think that's all I have. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Jared. Right on time. Welcome. So before we switch to questions and to the Q&A session, uh, I would like to now introduce our last speaker, Dr. Sylvie van der Werf, uh, who's a professor at the University of Paris and the head of the molecular genetics of RNA viruses laboratory at the Institute Pasteur. Her presentation will focus on surveillance strategies for detection of virus variants. Uh, Professor Sylvie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you for the invitation and for the introduction. And so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. Um, so I will focus on the surveillance strategies for SARS-CoV-2 variant detection. And uh, well, thanks to Gerald Lua for having uh, very nicely uh, set the stage. Um, oops. Thanks. Yeah. So <clears throat> I don't have to dwell too much on this. I mean, uh, as was mentioned already and, and shown, uh, we know we have a constant virus evolution uh, with the emergence of new variants and more variants uh, will certainly continue to emerge. And therefore it is really key to be able to have proper uh, surveillance of, of those variants and also understand uh, whether their uh, appearance in, in, in any uh, given region is uh, merely due to founder effects or whether there is a selective advantage uh, for uh, new variants. And uh, we are particularly concerned about uh, viruses and uh, variants that have um, new characteristics or different characteristics from previous um, variants that circulate in terms of transmissibility, disease severity, uh, potential immune escape or a therapeutic escape or diagnostic escape. And um, in addition uh, to the virus characteristics, uh, the epidemiological component is very important in defining actually variants of interest or variants of concern. Um, and uh, it needs to need to take into account whether there is significant community transmission uh, whether uh, we do see a given variant in multiple COVID-19 clusters or in multiple countries or uh, with an increasing uh, prevalence and in, in number of, of cases. And so as the variants are characterized by um, a mutant uh, mutation uh, signatures, so either mutations or um, deletions, uh, and uh, what is uh, striking actually is that um, we tend to see some clustering of um, convergent evolution um, with mutations appearing in specific regions, particularly of the spike, um, in the receptor binding domain, in the N terminal domain, but also around um, the furin uh, cleavage sites, uh, for which uh, there is um, data um, that allows to link some of those genetic, genetic changes to phenotypic uh, changes. So in that context, uh, variants of concern um, will um, be, um, our variants, um, variants that are qualified as variants of concern are those that have a global public health significance, 
So either with an increase in transmissibility or detrimental change in COVID-19 immunology, or increase in virulence with change in clinical disease presentation, or a decrease in effectiveness of public health and social measures on available diagnostics, vaccines, and therapeutics. And so as mentioned, um, by the previous speaker, uh, with um, vaccination being rolled out, uh, we're particularly concerned um, today about um, any variants that will um, uh, result in a lower uh, vaccine uh, effectiveness. So just briefly, um, the WHO has uh, currently classified four variants of concern, alpha, beta, gamma, and, and delta. And uh, right now we still have uh, five uh, variants of uh, interest uh, that are uh, classified by the WHO. And <clears throat> below what you can see is what I just mentioned is that at some positions, uh, there are uh, mutations or deletions that are specific of certain uh, of those uh, variants of concern, but there are also uh, differences. And uh, we are likely to see um, more differences uh, and more mutations um, that uh, will be of interest. So why genomic surveillance? What are the objectives? Obviously, this the objective is to monitor SARS-CoV-2 evolution, um, to be able to follow the circulation of uh, known variants, identify the introduction of known variants, describe their local or regional circulation, and uh, identify uh, their impact in specific uh, populations. And also, uh, most importantly, to identify new variants, um, and this requires to be able to link the sequence um, information with the epidemiology and with the phenotypic uh, characteristics. Now, one huge limitation um, in this uh, area is, uh, as mentioned previously, the, the differences in terms of um, the number of sequences that are made available and also in terms of timeliness uh, of av availability of um, sequences. So what methods do we have uh, for uh, genomic uh, surveillance? Um, we can distinguish um, methods that will uh, provide targeted sequencing that will be uh, targeted at some specific known mutations. Um, and uh, in particular, um, the differential or, or discriminatory uh, RT-PCR, also called screening RT-PCR, uh, that will uh, allow the detection of the presence or absence of specific uh, mutations. And I've listed some of them here that uh, for which uh, screening tests are available. Or, um, um, screening PCR that are targeted to, to, to specific uh, deletions. And uh, actually, um, this was um, um, very um, elegantly uh, used uh, based on the observation um, in the context of the emergence of the alpha uh, variant uh, initially in the United Kingdom, uh, and the observation that uh, one particular uh, RT-PCR uh, diagnostic kit uh, actually um, targeted a region of the S um, uh, gene uh, that uh, had a deletion in the, in the alpha variant, the so-called um, 6970 deletion, and as shown here, resulting in um, the S gene target uh, failure. And this was actually exploited uh, to um, follow um, the emergence of um, the alpha uh, variant uh, in the UK as exemplified here, but also in many other countries actually uh, to follow um, the uh, introduction and then um, the um, um, prevalence of um, this alpha variant in, 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 in the different uh, regions. Um, <clears throat> Now, of course, these targeted um, differential uh, RT-PCR uh, are limited to uh, what is available and um, newer methods uh, are um, under development that allow to analyze uh, more multiple uh, SNPs and uh, will be able to uh, discriminate better um, um, between different uh, variants. Um, in addition, uh, Sanger sequencing, which is usually uh, targeted to the S gene, uh, may come uh, in complements. 
So because this targeted sequencing, although it allows to follow uh, actually the evolution of uh, the different uh, the prevalence of different mutations, and I'm here showing actually exemplifying this here for uh, the targeted screening that is performed in France, uh, where you see, for instance, that uh, right now the L452R uh, mutation, which is present in the Delta variant, characteristic of the Delta variant, uh, is almost present at, at 100%. Um, the advantage of this uh, targeted screening is uh, the timeliness, uh, the fact that one can uh, also rely on uh, actually the mostly on, on the diagnostic uh, testing uh, uh, networks. Um, the cost is uh, reasonable and we don't need uh, very high uh, resources. However, the limitations is that um, because mutations may be common to several variants of concern, variants of interest, of, of variants under monitoring, or even other variants, uh, it is not necessarily easy to discriminate um, um, very um, um, precisely uh, between different variants. Um, the mutations that uh, will be targeted uh, by those screening tests may need to be adapted uh, to the mutation prevalence um, although a diminution in the prevalence might also be a signal that another variant might be taken over. And uh, so other limitations, of course, that this is not suitable for the detection of new variants. So the preferred um, method for uh, detection of new variants is in whole genome uh, sequencing. Uh, and uh, various uh, sequencing methods uh, are uh, available. Uh, and for more research-oriented um, um, uh, questions, uh, one may also um, want to analyze not only the consensus uh, sequences, but also to be looking at uh, some of the minority ones. So whole genome sequencing, uh, for example, has been uh, extremely uh, successful in uh, detecting um, the um, emergence of the beta, um, variant of concern in South Africa. Uh, in this phylogenetic analysis uh, uh, showed actually uh, these specific uh, viruses corresponding to beta uh, emerging and when linking that with epidemiological and, and um, uh, data, um, not only the increase in prevalence could be uh, seen, but also uh, the geographical spread. Uh, which was actually key for alerting about uh, this, uh, this variant. Now, what are the requirements for uh, genomic um, surveillance? Uh, so good represent representativeness, uh, both um, from a temporal perspective, from a geographical um, perspective, but also across the whole clinical spectrum from asymptomatic uh, all the way to ICU cases and also uh, across different um, age groups. Ideally, uh, timeliness is uh, very important and uh, also timely uh, data uh, sharing. Um, <clears throat> and not only uh, should sequences be uh, generated, uh, but uh, the analysis of uh, the data in a timely fashion uh, to be able to identify uh, potential uh, new emerging variants is also uh, absolutely key. And ideally, a uh, quick link um, to uh, genotype to phenotype <coughs> essence um, is important. So genomic surveillance will involve multiple actors, the testing labs, uh, both in the community and in hospitals, you can, these can be from the public and the private sector, the screening labs eventually, uh, also from the public and private sector, sequencing labs in the public and private sectors. Bioinformatics is an essential and extremely important uh, component, uh, and also uh, the need to link with epidemiologists, modelers, and uh, biologists. So the setup of uh, genomic surveillance uh, will require um, a very good organization and a very good uh, governance. So this genomic surveillance, um, ideally uh, for following uh, the um, evolution of prevalence uh, has to be based on random surveillance to detect an emergence of new variants with low prevalence and or increasing trends. Um, 
um, either countrywide or uh, even better, especially for large countries uh, at the state or regional department level. Uh, and uh, we uh, actually um, uh, perform both in the community and in the hospital. So this can be achieved either by sequencing uh, routinely or periodically a proportion of positive cases. For instance, in France, actually, we have every week uh, we sequence for currently 50% uh, of positive uh, cases that are uh, amenable for sequencing. And in parallel to this random sequencing uh, and random surveillance, um, <clears throat> it is desirable to have uh, interventional surveillance to investigate clusters or an abnormal signal of increased incidence in a given region, for instance, and also targeted surveillance, um, either based on positive screening for specific mutations, but this will obviously introduce biases, or targeted to severe cases, for instance, immunodepressed patients, uh, reinfections or vaccine failures, or therapeutic escape or uh, travel uh, related. So the type of uh, organization- Professor Van der Werf, sorry to disturb you. May I ask you to uh, start wrapping up the presentation? Yes, this Thanks. is my, uh, almost my last line. Uh, so the organization uh, will have to bring together actually uh, those different uh, actors, uh, moving samples from, the, from, the, from the, the patients where they have been collected to uh, the diagnostic and, and screening labs, uh, and then to the sequencing labs, uh, and also uh, integrating uh, the meta um, data and the patient um, health uh, records, uh, and uh, then uh, to have uh, a bioinformatics hub uh, to be able to analyze uh, those data and, and uh, identify the sequence. The points to consider are the sample flow, the data flow, uh, and metadata flow uh, along with sequence data is very important. Uh, taking also into account the patient data uh, protection uh, issues and uh, also the sequence uh, quality control issues. So to summarize, uh, genomic surveillance is key for real-time monitoring of SARS-CoV-2 variants. Timeliness, representativeness, and data sharing are essential. It requires mobilization of multiple resources and multiple actors. Uh, with a number of challenges uh, in the flow of samples and uh, data. Uh, and uh, this needs to be adapted, of course, to local uh, possibilities. Um, and it will definitely vary from um, in, in different uh, settings, and, and particularly in low and middle and income uh, countries. As I stressed already, bioinformatics component is uh, really key and uh, one needs a strong link uh, also to uh, make sense of the mutations that are identified. And I uh, mentioned here uh, some additional available resources. And so just to acknowledge actually the members of the French uh, um, Genomic Serene Consortium in Eugen, and I thank you for your attention. And sorry for being with over time. No, on the other hand, thank you very much. So in the interest of time, we're gonna jump straight into the questions. We have a few questions in uh, the Q&A box. Um, so I have a question from uh, Abayomi, and I think it's directed to you, Gerald. Um, I need a bit of enlightenment on the sample type being used for the emergency use authorization. Are these stored samples or freshly obtained samples? Has there been any comparison between both on the African block? So if I may get that question right, what has been happening is the samples are collected at public health facilities in different countries, and then they are shipped to the sequencing hubs. And normally that takes about four to six weeks to get this sequencing pipeline. So I wouldn't call them fresh samples. It hasn't happened in Africa that you collect samples and in a day or two these are sequenced right away. No. I've only seen that elsewhere. Thank you, Jared. I have another question from Abayomi again. Uh, what's the plan for in vitro diagnostics registration post emergency authorization? I don't know if this is a question for Jared only, or I could even open it. 
um, to others. Uh, please go ahead, Jared. I, I just wonder if it is meant for me, but what Africa CDC is currently doing is to try to develop diagnostic algorithm and share them with the member states. And at the moment, I think that was Dr. Rosanna showed the diagnostic algorithm that is currently being used. So this is not fixed. It, is, it stands to be changed depending on introduction of better diagnostics and also introduction of maybe, I, I, I think as the, 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 the pandemic tries to take different shapes, we know in Africa right now, the, the alpha band of concern is almost disappearing and we have Delta increasing. So I think at the moment, what I can say is they, they use different is the view as we go for over to you. Sorry, Jared, you're breaking up a little. Um, I have another question here, which is not only, uh, it's directed for the Africa CDC, but I would actually, I would invite others to answer this question as well. Um, the WHO Global Influenza Program is adapting guidance to develop integrated sentinel surveillance of influenza and SARS-CoV-2. They will include co-testing for these two pathogens and genomic sequencing. Does Africa CDC or the Institute Pasteur or any other organization represented here will support and play a role on the surveillance implementation? Professor Van Dorf, I would like to uh, perhaps direct the question to you first. Yes, well, <clears throat> definitely um, in, the, in the context of, of potential circulation or recirculation of influenza viruses, which have not been circulating very much <laughs> recently, uh, it is absolutely key that we continue uh, proper surveillance of um, the influenza viruses. And also, as you know, these viruses evolve very quickly as well. And uh, it is uh, uh, essential to be able to um, uh, follow actually the um, uh, genetic and uh, linked to antigenic variations uh, to inform actually the vaccine composition for influenza. So indeed there are um, testing, diagnostic tests that uh, um, allow to detect both influenza virus and, and uh, SARS-CoV-2. And so uh, there has been a guidance issued by WHO about uh, the way to, to process uh, those, uh, those uh, samples. Uh, and um, um, of course, uh, the, the sequencing uh, networks and consortia and, and the, the sequencing um, um, potential that has been um, put in place for um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, could be uh, leveraged to, to also do um, sequencing for um, influenza and, and increase actually our, our sequencing for influenza viruses in, in the near future when it will be there. Thank you. Professor Peeling, please go ahead. Yes, I, I just like to say that although, you know, it's really good to have, um, you know, COVID, uh, uh, SARS, sorry. Um, uh, although it's really nice to have the, the pathogen added to the influenza uh, surveillance program, uh, I like to say that, you know, um, from the last uh, big flu uh, epidemic of 2009, WHO and other partners committed to building capacity for uh, the global uh, influenza surveillance program in many countries. And I remember in Africa, 33 countries committed to doing that. But that at the beginning of the COVID uh, pandemic, we then look at how many countries are still uh, having an active uh, flu program so that we could maybe take some of the samples that are collected through that program to see whether COVID has arrived in Africa. And in fact, only a few countries have sustained their influenza uh, surveillance program. And so I think it's uh, not only just willingness, but also how can we support countries to make this happen and make it sustainable? I think that's a, a really important question to address. Um, and and if uh, if you know anybody has uh, any suggestions, that would be really nice to to hear. Thank you, Rosanna. 
So we are right on time and we don't want to be late, especially because it's been a long webinar. So um, I was giving the privilege of giving the closing remarks and I'm going to take advantage of this. So as the presentations and discussions today show, there are several main challenges uh, during this pandemic that have affected the global response. One of them is that we're navigating through uncharted territory. We're dealing with a new virus and a new disease, and we continue to learn new things on a regular basis about them. And another challenge is how fast the situation is changing from the evolution of virus variants that we have just spoke to the emergence of new technologies that was discussed in part one. So there's a saying in English that summarizes this well, we're building the plane as we fly it. It's quite challenging actually. And today we brought together a number of experts uh, from different countries with different levels of expertise to share their knowledge and experience on different parts of this plane that we are building together. Now, my question to you, the audience, is what can you do with this information? As members of a global diagnostics community, I believe we have a responsibility to inform, to educate, and to advocate for diagnostics. But the fact is uh, that in spite of all the challenges we are facing with this pandemic, it also creates an opportunity to strengthen diagnostic systems beyond COVID-19 with the potential benefits on various health indicators. And I believe we must seize this opportunity. So I would like to finish with a call to action directed at you, the audience. I would like to invite you to help us scale up our joint collective efforts to educate and advocate for diagnostics in order to improve access to COVID-19 tests globally and also improve diagnostics as a whole. Many governments continue to put too much emphasis on vaccines as if vaccines alone could actually bring the pandemic under control. And now, while we recognize the vaccines are probably the most important tool in the box, it is clear that vaccines alone will not solve the problem. And this is because, vaccine, because of vaccines hesitancy, because of limited access to vaccines, especially in low and middle income countries. Uh, because of lex limit, limited vaccine coverage, even in high income countries. And all these factors will continue to contribute to the emergence of virus variants, some of which will be able to evade the immune response created by vaccines. Another important element is that the virus has become endemic and it will continue to pop up here and there for years to come, further emphasizing the importance of diagnostics, which will then detect when the virus um, has an outbreak. So my take home message to you is that an effective pandemic response requires an integration of diagnostics, vaccines, drugs, and health system strengthening, which is something that we often forget. We cannot actually deliver diagnostics or the drugs or vaccines if the health, the health system is broken. Um, and if I may suggest, I think it's very important to target decision makers with this message of an integrated response because decision makers can decide whether or not to prioritize diagnostics in their context. And many of them in low and middle income countries have not. They're putting all the resources or most of the resources in vaccines and they disregard the importance of diagnostics as part of this integrated response to detect who's sick, to, uh, to measure and monitor the evolution of the virus and so help us determine the efficacy of vaccines when they're used. So with that, I would like to thank you very much and I would like to hand it over to Sandra on behalf of the Myriad Foundation and ACDX for her closing remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. So on behalf of the Myriad Foundation, I would like to warmly thank all of you and especially the speakers and all the panelists of the webinar for sharing their expertise and allowing broad discussions during this conference. Uh, a special thanks to Professor Rosanna Peeling and new Dr. Alex Costa, who moderated this event uh, successfully. And please note that this webinar having been recorded, we'll be pleased to send you the link of uh, the video in the coming days. Mm -hmm. I also remind you that the next ACDX course will be held at Les Pensières from the 23rd uh, to 28th of January. 
uh, you can find some information and the application file uh, on the Merio Foundation website. So thank you again, everyone, and have a nice day. Uh, good evening. Goodbye.